This is the uh, the light relief between Brussels recast and uh, part 36, uh, obviously, costs. Um, got three topics. I'm going to cover the first two uh, relatively quickly. Um, costs budgeting. Um, I'd like to stand here and say to you that we've got an experience that's consistent um, across the firm and across all the different courts that people are dealing with and that there was a very clear message about how you should go about that. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that because um, our experience has been that it just depends entirely on who you're in front of. Uh, it varies from master to master, judge to judge, court to court. Um, Perhaps there is a slight trend that it's being taken more seriously in the regions, the north, than it is in London. Um, we've seen one instance in Manchester of one of our own budgets being very closely scrutinised, but that's really our only experience so far of that happening. Um, we did have an instance last week in London, actually, where the other side's cost budget was, uh, was halved, which is a bit of a stark warning to everybody that they do need to take it seriously. Um, feedback is being taken at the moment on this. I know that Claire attended a session recently on, with uh, Lord Justice Jackson um, where some feedback was given. And the feedback really from our costs team um, on cost budgeting has been that there's a bit of an issue with the timing um, and that actually it would be better, um, particularly in instances where the parties can't agree on their directions, for cost budgets to be required after you've had the first case management conference. Um, and there is a suggestion now that there might be a question included in the allocation questionnaire asking the parties if there's a good reason that you should defer the cost management discussions until you have concrete directions. So a bit of a watch this space at the moment. The, the key message is don't necessarily agree to anything in the other side's budget that you might want to take a point on later um, because uh, obviously you put yourself in a difficult position. Um, court fee increases um, are something that have attracted um, a lot of publicity recently and hopefully have, have come to everybody's attention. There was a big, uh, there was a big rush at the uh, end of February and the start of March for people to try and issue claims before they came into force. Um, for money judgments, or sorry, for money claims, uh, specified and unspecified, on the 9th of March, there was a substantial increase in the fees. The big headline being um, for claims between £10,000 and £200,000, 5% um, of the claim value will apply. So maths, as a lot of people in this room will testify, isn't a strong point, but uh, for an example, a £100,000 claim, you'll have to pay £5,000 to, uh, to issue. For claims exceeding £2,000, or they're unlimited in value, uh, a £10,000. when they said that, but they weren't especially complimentary. Um, apparently, the, um, the Ministry of Justice staff have been told to, uh, to keep the situation under review. Um, so again, we will update you uh, when we know more. Um, the last topic that I'm going to cover is um, sanctions for breach of court rules. Um, the background to, to this is um, the test in CPR 3.91 to do with applications for relief from court sanctions and what the consideration should be. Um, and the very much talked about uh, Mitchell and News Group newspapers case um, from 2013, where the claimant served his cost budget six days late and one day before the CMC, uh, which caused the hearing to be adjourned and substantial costs to be incurred. Um, and there was a lot of guidance given in that case as to how courts should be interpreting uh, the, the rules in the CPR. Um, there have recently been um, the Courts of uh, Appeal recently handed down a judgment um, in three cases, Denton being one of them, which was, um, it's a combined judgment, which was a case concerning repeated failures to comply with deadlines for service of witness statements, which caused a trial date to be vacated. Uh, decadent Vapours and uh, Beckon, which was a case concerning late payment of court fees. Um, the, the background's not particularly important, but it essentially... Uh, a, a cheque was put in the DX on the day they were due, so it would have been a day late anyway, and then got lost somewhere, and it only became apparent at the pre-trial review. Uh, and then utilised TDS and Davies, which was a slightly more complicated case concerning uh, the filing of a late cost budget, and at the same time, uh, what was considered a cumulative failure of a 45-minute delay in complying with another part of an order. Um, 
decision uh, in this case, much anticipated if you're keen on your court sanctions, um, was a joint ju judgment by uh, the Master of the Rolls, Lord Dyson, and Lord Justice Voss. Um, they recognised the criticisms that there have been of the decision in Mitchell and the guidance that have been given, and they actually allowed interventions from the Law Society and the Bar Council so that they could deal with those explicitly. Um, in their view, um, the courts uh, had, had taken, an, taken the incorrect emphasis uh, in applying 3.9 from what they'd said in Mitchell, um, and the result had been uncooperative behaviour from parties who were trying to, to get a windfall benefit as a result. Um, in their, in their judgment, they held that a misunderstanding of Mitchell had led to unjust and disproportionate decisions, and they referred to these cases and said in two of them that had resulted in uh, an, uh, an unduly draconian approach, uh, and in the third, uh, Denton, an unduly relaxed approach. Um, so both sides of the spectrum being considered. Um, in wrapping it up, they said that a culture of non-compliance should not be tolerated, um, but at the same time, relief should not automatically be denied where there has been a serious breach, all the circumstances of the case, which is a key part of the relevant provisions of the CPR, should be considered. Um, very importantly, they set down what they termed um, restating of the guidance from Mitchell um, in a three-stage test, which you'll see summarised very briefly on the slide. Um, the first part of the three-stage three, the three approach is to assess whether the failure to comply with the rule, the practice direction and the order is serious or significant. Um, if it's not serious or significant, then relief should usually be granted um, and stages two and three are less important. Now, the important change here is that in Mitchell, the term trivial had been used rather than serious or significant. And there have been a lot of semantic arguments about what trivial really meant uh, and how that should be dealt with. Um, the Law Society had suggested that materiality might be a better threshold, um, but they didn't, they didn't agree with that. They didn't necessarily feel that materiality was very easily applied when you consider the difference between um, the case itself and the uh, issues for the courts, because the two things aren't necessarily the same um, in terms of wasting court time or court fees. Um, stage two, which isn't technically part of the guidance in the CPR, is to assess the reasons for the default. Um, they emphasised that the examples they'd previously given in Mitchell were, were only examples um, and said the more serious the breach, uh, the better the reason will actually need to be. And then the third stage um, is to consider all the circumstances of the case, including the promptness of the application uh, for relief, from, from, for relief from, uh, from the breach, uh, so that the court can deal justly with the application. Now, in Mitchell, they talked about... Um, there are two factors specifically listed in the CPR, and they talked about giving those paramount weight in Mitchell. And they've slightly revised that now and said particular weight um, should be given because the, the concern was that judges had taken paramount and, and that had made them think that these were the only concerns that they should take into account and that other factors should be ignored. Um, so those, those two factors which get given particular importance are the need to conduct litigation efficiently and at proportionate cost, and the need uh, to enforce compliance with rules and orders. But overriding all of that, it's always necessary to have regards to all the circumstances of the case. Um, just, just by way of conclusion, they noted in the judgment that um, there, there will be potential cost sanctions for parties who look to take advantage of, uh, of failures to comply. So um, in particular, they've said that uh, when you're looking at costs at the end of a case, um, if an offending party wins, it might find that its own recovery has been reduced. And an unsu unsuccessful party who, who has offended the court by, for example, unreasonably failing to agree uh, to an extension uh, when, it, when it would have been in everybody's interest to do so may in fact be exposed to indemnity costs. So some very clear guidance there that people need to be very careful and, uh, and they need to cooperate rather than look to obtain a windfall.